away with you. <laughs> yes, please stand by. <laughs> All right, uh, we're good to go. So good afternoon and good evening, wherever you might be. Uh, welcome to another episode of the uh, West Coast Jazz Hour. Uh, we've been very fortunate with having uh, lots of great uh, special guests who are talking about their career and about their experiences in, um, in the jazz world, specifically on the West Coast. And, Today we also have a very special guest who's a, a dear friend of ours. Uh, we've played, uh, both Josh and me have played with, uh, with Kim. Uh, I've played in this big band. I've played in the, the, uh, the Herbie, uh, Herbie Hancock, Joni Mitchell project. Um, this man has played with uh, Stan Kenton, Bob Florence, uh, Claire Fisher. Uh, his discography is maybe one of the largest discographies that I know on large ensemble because there's a whole lot of large ensemble stuff in there so today we're welcoming a uh, saxophone player woodwind player composer arranger and educator kim richmond to the show welcome kim Thanks thank you thank you nice to be here with you mm -hmm. all yeah. right great. and of great course and of course with my uh, co-host and the brother in arms uh, josh nelson um, so, uh, Kim, uh, what I usually do with uh, all of the episodes is that I ask uh, a little bit of background of every uh, guest, and that mainly uh, comes with the question, how did you roll into the West Coast jazz scene? Because I think you moved in the late 60s to yes, LA? that's right. right. Would you, 67. Would you, would you, yeah. would you mind uh, uh, talking a little bit about that? Sure. I'm originally from Illinois, Champaign, Illinois, and that's where the University of Illinois is. And I went to school there, music school. I uh, got a couple of bachelor degrees, and then I was getting uh, draft notices for, and it was Vietnam War time in the 60s. So I uh, decided that I would, uh, after I dodged about, you know, two or three of the notices with uh, education, I went, wasn't going to get away with it again. I couldn't go to graduate school. So uh, I uh, auditioned for the service in the bands, and I got in the Air Force band called the Airmen of Note. It's a jazz group. And uh, I was there for four years until 67. I got out, and I said, I've got to either go to the East Coast or the West Coast, uh, either New York or, or Los Angeles, because that's the that's going to be the music business and so forth. So uh, I looked into, and I looked into Boston too, because that was a hot spot at the time, especially with the school there and, and uh, like that. So, but that, <laughs> when I went there and I inter I was interviewed, uh, he said, you know, you don't really want to be here. It's too much snow and cold. <laughs> I said, you know, you're right. <laughs> so we had our last uh, tour of the Airman and Note out, out here in say here out in uh, LA and um, uh, I really kind of liked the scene I liked it uh, what I was getting into and at that time I had already said I would take a uh, assistantship at North Texas State uh, mm. Leon Breeden was somebody I had acquainted with quite well and he had offered me that and I had to call him and say you know Leon I really, I'm gonna do this eventually I better do it now this uh, studio scene and all that stuff so I was here in 67 and uh, been here ever since. And the, uh, uh, the saying that I had always heard is don't move around, don't go on the road, don't yeah. you know, stick in one place and so forth. That wasn't really the answer for me. <laughs> I found out that that wasn't really, I got an offer to do Woody Herman. I turned that down. I got a chance to do, uh, 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 what's the, the trumpet player, a famous trumpet player. Doc? Benny Goodman's, uh, uh, Benny Goodman's trumpet player that was famous. I can't think of the name. Oh, um, Harry James? Harry James. Harry. I got a chance to do Harry James <laughs> band. I turned that down. And I was, wow. but I was running out of money. And uh, so I ended up playing uh, in a, with a comedy act, playing piano of all things. I don't play uh, the piano. I play <laughs> Ranger's piano. And I was there. And, the, and he was the bass player, the comedian. And when he'd do his act, he'd just stop playing, you know. <laughs> Grim. So it was just me and a drummer, and it was terrible. But anyway, I did a few weeks of that, and then I, I got a call to do uh, Stan Kenton, and I 
I couldn't afford not to do it, you know, and yeah. I always <laughs> wanted to play with that band. So I went on the road for nine weeks with Stan Kenton and uh, never looked back, kind of, you know. But uh, I did get back into town and did an album with him, and that was that was a good experience. And that's probably, and I did that on tenor saxophone, and uh, which is not my ideal instrument. I play all the saxophones, but uh, I don't consider myself a stylist on that. I just do uh, studio work or whatever I mm -hmm. comes along for that. I'm more of an alto player. <clears throat> and um, I, uh, uh, what was I going to say? I, uh, on tenor. Um, and then you got back into town after Kent. Got back into town and, and started playing alto again. And I know some guys said, oh, well, you're not so bad of a player after all. <laughs> <laughs> I think I probably sucked on tenor. So I only had one one solo in the whole thing, and that was on intermission riff every every ah, night. Oh, okay. In D it, flat. Yeah. So, <laughs> but uh, I it love was, that too, it was, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've you know I I we played in my band too, so it's yeah it's, yeah. But you know uh, it was a good experience, and I should have done more road work, but I you know uh, it was. I love Stan Kenton. He's one of my favorite leaders. Uh, he and Louis Belson I played in Louis' band when I'm back here. Back oh yeah. LA. So it was it was it was really nice, and uh, I haven't regretted being in L.A. Uh, I don't really follow what we, they would say in West Coast style. Uh, mm -hmm. Back then, it was pretty delineated. Uh, West Coast was cool school, you know. Right. And uh, now it's all combined, and there's no. That's such, such division, but mm. uh, unless Trump says so, so. <laughs> <laughs> build a wall around. It. Then we got division. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very, very smart. Very smart yeah. interjection over there. <laughs> yeah, right. So anyway, uh, I've uh, been in the studio scene here uh, since the '70s. It took me a while to get into it. I started off in, as far as writing out here in. Uh, with commercials, uh, started in jingles, and I, huh. I was like uh, uh, kind of assistant to a guy named Don Speck, who was a really great um, uh, jingle writer. He had Bush Beer and a lot of other accounts and so forth. And uh, that on, went on for about three years, and I enjoyed that. And I played in a lot of his sessions, too. Um, uh, Buddy Clark was a bass player. He wow. was a contractor. Wow. Lou Levy was on that a lot of times. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the drummer. Uh, Stan Levy was there. Oh, great. Victor Feldman a couple wow. times uh, on the piano. And uh, um, anyway, I'm, I'm losing names again. Yeah. But that was, that was kind of fun, and it got me into writing for film at that time. Of course, it's not, we don't do it the same way now. But uh, it was uh, quite a growing experience. Right. And, <clears throat> yeah, and I got to play in some bands like Louis Belson's bands and and so forth like that and do shows and so I started to get into the business more you know and especially the live stuff and, and some of the studio things <clears throat> so the career went on so that I I, um, I was writing as much as I was playing not not necessarily writing for money but uh, um, it was my own stuff and you know stuff like that and I would write some commissions now and then and start getting to the educational end of it and so forth. But in, in uh, I think it was 1980, I decided I was um, going to really be a player and I was going to stop writing, you know, made that decision and I laid down the law for myself. And I did that pretty much. I stopped writing for anything and I really started calling studios, calling contractors and so forth. I started working at Universal Studios, really. And, no, I was I was lucky, but I, I, I didn't make a pest. I can't make a pest of myself. I can't do that thing like some people do. And when I got when I was writing back in the '70s, more for some TV shows, I had guys calling me all the time. It really turned me off, you know. Yeah. I mean, some guys, it's okay, but that's part of the business. But I, if if somebody started doing that to me, I just don't don't hire them at all. You know? mm. <laughs> String players, it would do. But anyway, I got to the point where I could. I, got acquainted with some contractors and they would hire me at Universal. And it was, I'll tell you a story about that. Um, one of the first things I had to do was on baritone saxophone, which is fine. I had a baritone saxophone, but it didn't have a low A. Mm -hmm. and a lot of times they write for low A and special saxophone stuff. And uh, so I said, oh gosh, I'm probably going to get a tune that has a low A, you know, so <laughs> something. 
some some cue, and so I uh, borrowed a, uh, a saxophone. You know, and I had a low A, and I did that. And it was no low A, but I I had it anyway. And that happened about three times, and I had to borrow this. And I said, I, why don't I just buy one for Pete's sake? You know, so I got one. It was not that expensive then as it is now. I think it was three thousand dollars, and uh, with a low A, I never got called for baritone again. <laughs> so I have a virgin you know, baritone. Uh, we went down to the Sun Circle, the cookout started. What am I going to do? <laughs> oh, no worries. Hey, we're yeah. recording over here. <laughs> <laughs> She's not paying attention. That's my niece. Oh, and, no uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, you can edit that out. Some yeah. sounds all so good. I, yeah, <laughs> right. I, uh, I started to do some other studio work, and it oh, went very yeah. well. I ended up... Uh, doing a couple series at uh, Fox and that was, that was fun. So I've had a smattering of, of, of doing uh, playing in studios quite a bit. I was kind of on the periphery of it all. But uh, yeah. I think my success is just sticking around long enough. You know? <laughs> well, and that you're an amazing writer and player. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that counts for something. Yeah, yeah and definitely. I have to give credit where credit is due, too. My wife, is uh, uh, Chris, is a painter, but she is uh, very encouraging, always encouraging me to uh, do... Uh, to study, to play jazz, and to, to be creative, you know, and I, uh, I've never had had that before. So mm -hmm. I, you know, just studio work is not that creative. Studio work is a craft. Right. It's not necessarily art. And uh, so she encourages me to, to do my art, and, and I think that's great. Uh, she's always pestering me to practice. You know, yeah. Oh, that's great! That Inspiring, stuff. hasn't she? Yeah. Uh, some of her work been featured on your album covers. She's done all my album covers I, except for I one. love that. Yeah. That collaboration of the, the yeah. different arts coming together. It's the price is right too, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And she's done, other, she's done other album covers for other people too, and she, and she really? usually doesn't charge them. You know, so. oh, yeah. She has one coming out, uh, David Angel's band. Oh, oh yeah. And David is a real brilliant writer, and he hasn't had a recording, and uh, Jim Self is producing a recording of a double album of his stuff, and it's really excellent. I had a participation in it and I was doing booth work for them. You know? Oh. And, uh, but Chris is, uh, uh, one of her paintings is on the cover. So oh, that's, lovely. That's, yeah. that's yeah. great. I think Tally Sherwood's working on that, isn't he? That's right. Yeah. I was there when he was working on it. Sounds amazing. Oh, yeah. 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 Very and good. I think, I think also what, what, uh, what is so cool about you, Kim is especially, I mean, I've known you now for, I believe three, three and a half years. And from the beginning that I heard about you is that you're always also trying to find opportunities for young musicians yeah. to play with you and also to have, you know, like uh, a meeting of uh, experienced veteran musicians with uh, young and upcoming players such as myself, but also Will Brom and um, Adam Bravo and Jamie Tate. You love to use Jamie Tate and all of that. So I think that's a super cool thing yeah. that you're doing that you're also trying to bring people together with your with your own projects as yeah. well well you know we need to pass this on if yeah. it's going to survive and i was frankly very uh worried about it about uh, i think it's the year 2000 or 1999 something like that mm -hmm. and in that we weren't getting an influx of new musicians in town uh i don't know why at that point it's before you guys got here yeah. I don't know, Josh, where you were around, weren't you? Yeah, but I didn't really come on the scene until... You were still a student? In late 90s, I knew you early 2000s, actually. That's when I kind of started uh -huh. doing it. Yeah, because yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember you were a student at uh, Long Beach, I that's think. That's right, so, yeah. So I remember you from that. Yeah. And one of my big first gigs, well, big rehearsal band first gigs, but I got to meet so many great cats, was Mike Barone's big band, and that's yeah. we were in that together. That's right. With yeah. Bill Perkins and John Guerin, and it was just amazing. I still have Now you're so memories. busy, I can't get you to play in my band. Oh. <laughs> you haven't tried in a good. while. Please, I want to play with you. I miss actually. I miss, yeah. miss it actually. Yeah. So. <laughs> right. so, but anyway, that's uh, yeah. That's that. What I have, I have wanted to do is is to pass this legacy on and try to. Well, what I was going to say is in the '90s it wasn't happening. I mean, we were just kind of dying out, to tell you the truth. And uh, then all of a sudden, in the early 2000s. We had a whole influx of young musicians coming, and they were great. They were great players, like yourselves, you know, and uh, uh, from everywhere. You know, a lot of it was North Texas State, but it was uh, San Francisco and, you know, Europe and 
and uh, Chicago and New York and so forth. There was a big movement to, to, to move out here, too, from New York. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and there were a couple big uh, movements like that. And that was one of them also. And uh, so I was very grateful for that. Uh, I wasn't, uh, I mean, I was really pressed to be playing better. <laughs> you know, and two, it was a it was a situation where I had to get my act together because all these youngsters, young whippersnappers, I call them, yeah. are, are coming along and really you know playing like Danny Jankelo. I mean, sheesh, can't, how, how do you you know? So he he inspires me all over the place. Yeah, a yeah. lot of he players, sure so. is inspired. I think his dad's actually watching. I saw him come on ah, Don, Don Jankelo. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah. Danny's great. Mm -hmm. So I'm one of his biggest fans, and I, <laughs> I enjoy. You know, hearing him at any time, and then I, you know, when I get a chance to play with him, that's great too. Yeah. So I don't. I'm not so worried about it anymore. Mm. I had an experience that has that touches on that for just a moment, and uh, it's uh, we. I'm a, I'm active in ASMAC, which is a, uh, I was a past president of that. That's uh, American Society of Music Arrangers and Composers, and uh, that's what we do. Is we, you know. Uh, put on clinics and have workshops and stuff like that. And, and, uh, it's for education, but you know, to, to further the, the, uh, interests of arrangers and composers, especially arrangers. It started yeah. out as an arranging thing. Well, arrangers sometimes don't get credit for stuff. Well, the only uh, performers and their composers do. But anyway, uh, one of the people that we had do a workshop and I was playing in his band, some as Johnny Mandel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, I, I was coordinating it all. I went out to his place and some, gave me some scores and showed me some stuff. And I was a really fan of his music. I mean, just you know, great arranger and yeah. composer, as we all know. But anyway, I said I'd like to be able to like hand some of these out and show them on the screen. He says, "Oh no, no, I don't want to do that." I said, why? He says, everybody will start writing like me. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, two things, Johnny. First of all, nobody's going to start to write like you. Nobody can exactly. write that well yeah. from what you do, you know. And the second of all, we've got to pass this stuff on. That's I mean, right. I don't, you know, you're not going to be here forever, and it's we've got to have people, you know, uh, that he says, well, I don't know. And he finally came around. I had to do some hard convincing. So that's what I was talking about. You've got to pass it on. Right. I've been to a few ASMAC events most recently online when you were doing your big band uh, arranging right. which I mm -hmm. thought was fa absolutely fantastic okay. but also some of the other ones that inspired me were I, I Van Alexander oh yeah that was yeah. a great one and yeah. um, uh, Richard Carpenter and just mm -hmm. a few of them uh, just fantastic it's a great organization yeah. I'm I, I really enjoy it so mm -hmm. yeah yeah oh, it's a lot of fun to yeah do. and I'm I in the meantime gotten into uh, doing things on Final Cut Pro, which was uh, editing video, and so I've, I'm one of the people that edit some of the workshops wow. that Asmac does. I don't do that much of it anymore, but because uh, uh, we've got some young people doing it too, <laughs> so but that's uh, it's, it's let me really um, see uh, the workshop in a slow way, so I can really absorb it, you know. Yeah. And that's that's been a good educational thing mm. for me. Yeah. Right on. Well, if you don't mind, let's uh, let's listen to some music because okay. you were talking about uh, Stan, Stan Kenton being the first band that you uh, went on the road with. So uh, why don't we play this composition of uh, Stan Kenton that you picked? Yeah, I know what I was going to say before about Stan Kenton. Yeah, that is that was probably the least. Um, well, let's, how do I put this? The least uh, to show me off. Let's say uh, at least so the least showcase for me because I didn't really, you know, I was always <laughs> in the band, but I was just a face there, and uh, on tenor, and it wasn't my really my instrument, and yet it's the most famous thing I've done. <laughs> I mean, everybody knows Stan Kenton, and I mean they say, yeah, you were with Stan Kenton. That's all. That's all you want to know about, you know, <laughs> and so forth. So. That's that's what I was going to say before. Is that uh, it? Didn't I didn't get showcased in there? I didn't really get promoted. I, that was fine, you know, yeah. only for one tour, and it, they didn't pay very very well at all. I paid one hundred and seventy five dollars a week, and you had to pay for your all your food and your hotel. Whoa! Every, yeah. every yeah. other night, we stayed in a hotel every other night. It was hit and run. Yeah. And I mean, I didn't make any money on that thing, and uh, I really couldn't afford to do that forever. And yeah. they asked me to go out again. Uh, I think on alto, because um, there's only one alto in there, 
didn't think Ray Reed was going to go out again. And I said, I'll go out, but for twice as much money, 350. He says, you really don't want to go on the road, do you? <laughs> 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 I said, You're right, I don't. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, that was, it's the least paying, it's the least, that's, that's the inverse ratio of Hollywood, we call it. You know? <laughs> the least expert you have to be, the more you get paid. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More yeah. expert, yeah, at least you get paid. So, anyway, right. go ahead. I'm interrupting you. No, 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 no worries. Great. <laughs> no worries. We're, yeah. we're, we, we're dying to hear all of these stories and yeah. these experiences. Yeah. Well, that but, band at 67, it was uh, with D. Barton. Yeah. And uh, he was the drummer. And he had been a trombone player on the band originally, but uh, he was the drummer with that band. And all the compositions that we did on the record that followed that were his compositions. And it was San Kenton Presents the Music of Dee Barton. Yeah. And uh, Dee was a, a, a old codger. He was kind of crank, you know, but he really believed me. He says, I don't believe in two five ones, you know. <laughs> he didn't write many. So um, yeah. it was, uh, but he wrote some excellent stuff and we're gonna probably hear some of this now. Yeah. And, and uh, we wanna do three thoughts first? Yeah. Okay, that was one of my favorites that we did. Uh, we did it on almost, did a, didn't do only his music on tour, but that's all we recorded on that record. Three Thoughts was my favorite tune because it had a section right at the beginning and the end where the band plays one tempo and the rhythm section plays another tempo. So cool. Yeah. Mm, yeah. yeah. Um, for the recording, um, I'm trying to think, uh, I'm thinking that the, the bass player uh, came on, he's a famous bass player. He came on for the recording only. Boy, I wish I do my homework and get oh, names. Oh, who was that? Yeah, you could probably see it on the album. But anyway, we had another bass player for the tour, but Stan wasn't really that happy with him, I guess. And, and he brought this other guy on who was sight reading everything. So all he did was walk everything. So you'll hear on this thing, this was a real, this, this beginning thing was looser. Don Bagley? Don Bagley, yeah. Don Bags. Bagley, yeah. yeah. And he became a good friend of mine. Bags. Too, oh, cool. And did a lot of playing with him. But he, he had, he was sight reading everything. So when it was open, he would just walk, you know, which worked. But we weren't used to doing that. We were used to having it real free, and the bass player was free also, you know. So you'll hear that in there. And then the solos are by uh, uh, John Diversa. No, Jay Diversa. Jay Diversa. Yeah, and, John Diversa's uh, dad, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Ray Reed you know, on, on alto. Yeah, he plays lead alto in the bands. Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Great. So let's give a listen. Okay. Uh, everybody who's uh, listening live, this is uh, Three Thoughts by Stan Kenton with uh, Kim Richmond on tenor. Ah, it's this one. Sorry, I have to fire up YouTube for a second. Now they're quiet. Yeah. <laughs> they're all of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, a couple of people are saying hello on... Uh, on uh, Is there a chat? On, yeah. Chat. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yo, Yo Kim, Adam Bravo oh, says yeah. hi. Yeah. Yeah, Adam, how you doing, man? So here we go. I got the YouTube going on. So here we go. Three Thoughts by Stan Kenton. Okay. I don't see anything in the chat. <laughs>
That's that's amazing. We I've over the course of these uh, of these podcasts, we've heard now a bunch of uh, different recordings from different eras from uh, uh, from Canton. Um, you know, like uh, Pat Senator played something uh, when he was playing in the band with Jerry McKenzie from the Adven- Adventures in, in Jazz and Adventures in Blues. Yeah. yeah. Um, some of the, the the Holman stuff that uh, Willis wrote for for Kenton. Um, and also in different configurations because the Adventures in Jazz has monophoniums on it. This is yeah. more of a normal, or more normal bands. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what's what's super interesting to me is that I think D. Barton is like maybe the least like projecting drummer that Stan maybe ever had in his band because it's really like Don who's you know like really plowing through and you know like making a yeah. solid time and and d is sort of you know like floating uh-huh. over that but yeah. you know it's it's super energetic but it's like it's 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 very hard to to describe what i'm what i'm feeling when yeah. i'm hearing d it's a very interesting way of playing drums mm. well he, it's, his personality was very gruff i don't know whether that means anything to you but i mean he was friendly and everything but he was like uh, no I'm not, I'm not taking any shit from anybody you know like that thing that i mean he personified that thing and he took charge of a lot of this it was on the road mostly you know and uh yeah i think bags came in and maybe stole the show a little bit you know, in, in some way like that but uh yeah he was he was uh he was kind of a dictator. He had his own band and mm-hmm. uh, for a while. And uh, uh, I don't know. He did some movies, and uh, I think yeah. he had some problems. Do you remember that? Did you hear about that? If somebody didn't agree or oh. he didn't agree with some of the production stuff. I know. Like, he worked on all those Clint Eastwood films, right? Well, that's he was, yeah, he was doing Clint Eastwood things. You know? And I don't know what the thing was, but he, he actually walked out on a movie. That's oh. the last movie he did. Oh, boy. Wow. And he moved back to... Uh, Louisiana or Mississippi, I can't remember what it was. He started okay. teaching in college back there, but it was, I, I hated to see it in that way, you know. So you know, it's not with us anymore. But but he was a uh, he was a might uh, mighty you know uh, force mm. in the band at that time. So I was kind of um, I mean he did do a lot of floating. Uh, we, we call floating uh, uh, you know of of nature of technique right. but uh i was surprised to hear you say that you were almost saying he didn't dominate as much as bags did and and he actually did he did do most of the dominating mm-hmm. and stan was fine with it you know mm-hmm. yeah and he just let him go mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah that's kind of a, a compare comparable thing that i'm noticing that stan really liked drummers uh-huh. who uh who were taking charge of yeah. uh, of the band yeah. And kind of with with D, there's like a, a similar type of vibe. And this might have been like a couple of years later when John Van Olen came in the band. Mm-hmm. And John mm-hmm. Van Olen started also out as a trombone player and then oh. started to play drums mm-hmm. and actually has like the same kind of like very loose vibe, but, you know, like a very, you know, projecting feel of, of time and taking right. taking charge. So that's like, yeah. that's kind of interesting to yeah. to think about and to hear that. Yeah. That's great. And that was a really slang. Both of those those solos were fantastic. Ray Reed, yeah. I'm not really familiar with. He's really yeah. burning. He was great. He wow. was a really good soloist. And, yeah. Uh, you know, good musician and started as a flute player. He was a flute mm-hmm. player in okay. college. college. Yeah. That was. I think it was here. I think it was in North okay. Beach. But uh, yeah, they were both great soloists and, uh, yeah. you know, uh, John DeVersa has inherited everything his father did and gone further with it you know? yeah <laughs> so, uh, I really respect that yeah and and, and ray uh, ray didn't do as much in town as famously as as he did on the road but mm. uh, he was a good player he wrote a good book too and i try to remember the name of it i have it oh really but yeah it came out uh, and it's about his last year but uh it was it was a music thing you know yeah right, so. very cool i mean that's the Part of the show I love doing with Kevin is that we get to talk about some of the more well-known names, uh-huh. but also make discoveries of yeah. players like that, which we just you know haven't come ac- I haven't come across yeah. yet. So yeah. Yeah. we've heard or we don't know. You look it up now. Oh, that's him, and then you start connecting the dots, and <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, as long as we talk about Stan Kenton, let me tell you my Kenton story. 
Please. Everybody yeah. had. Everybody <laughs> says, Kenton stories. I only have one. <laughs> 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 and that's worth talking about. Well, Stan was uh, a very nice person, and, and he and I talked and uh, were very friendly and you know, didn't hang out together. I mean, he was drinking heavily at that period, but he, and I don't drink. But, um, but he came on the bus and sat on the bus a lot of times and went from place to place. And uh, there, was, there was a time there where we started to get into a discussion, and he was always of the opinion, uh, very loudly, that he didn't like a vibrato on the band, and he didn't like, uh, you know, like, I said, well, but, but Count Basie, you know, I'd start, I'd be the advocate for the other <laughs> side, you know. Yeah. And it's not that I wanted to play with vibrato, but I wanted to, to talk, you know, and see, see how I could push him a little bit, and, you know, like that. And so I said, well, you yeah, know, but, you know, Count Basie, Marshall Royal, and Duke Ellington, Johnny Hodgins, oh, they're pussies. <laughs> <laughs> ah, and he would really get in and be very, you know. And so we would we would stage an argument because one of the trumpet players thought that Stan Kenton was the absolute god. Uh -huh. uh, whatever Stan Kenton said, you don't dispute that at all. And here I was <laughs> disputing it. Yeah. So this guy is Carl, who's his name, one of the trumpet players, like third trumpet. And he would get all oh, so upset. He said, how can you say that Stan said to run that thing? <laughs> <laughs> so he started laughing, you know, and uh, we would do that every day so that he'd get upset. You know, finally, <laughs> I think he finally caught on, but it was just, it was, it was one of the entertainment parts of that band on the bus. So it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, uh, it's also it's amazing to hear that uh, Kenton was like very open-minded to discuss uh, different, you know, like aspects of music, but he was staying strong to what he wanted to and was also very re revolutionary with his own band and went through different stages, but yeah. um, that he was also open-minded to listen to guys such as yourself and other people in the band. That's really yeah. nice to hear. Yeah. Well, it was interesting, and, and and then I later found out that his early '40s band, uh, the Saxons, had a lot of vibrato. You know, mm. they were like everybody else's band at that mm -hmm. point. Yeah. So uh, I was, so, is that really Stan Kenton's band? All that vibrato. But um, yeah, so it was. It's a style that he really right. kept to. He was a stylist, and he was an one of the few evolutionary musicians that I knew. Um, there's, sure, there's more that I don't know about, but uh, like Miles Davis was an evolutionary musician, and so was John Coltrane. They changed their style. They changed, they grew with everything. They didn't stay the same. Other people, uh, like Louis Armstrong, bless his heart, and he was great at what he did, but he never changed. He got to a certain point, and that's how he right. kept it, because that's what was everybody expected him to do, you know. Mm. And when, like, and, and Bill Perkins was the same way. He was, he, he was influenced by other people and he started playing differently than he did in the 50s mm. you know? and a lot of people gave him a uh, guff about it they didn't mm. want to hear that they wanted to hear how he sounded in the 50s you know? <laughs> he said well I don't, I don't play that way anymore same mm. with miles and play, same with uh coltrane mm. and uh stan too i mean he didn't play the stuff that he played in the late 40s you know when i was on the band he didn't play the stuff he had was the 50s so he was always progressing mm. and uh he would have a saying that he said, people would say, well, what's, what's your favorite band? He said, the present one, you know, yeah. the, the current one, his, yeah. voice, his favorite style. Yeah. You know, so that was great about it. Yeah. Uh, there's one more track on that, uh, on that album. I wonder whether you can play it. Um, I looked it up and now I forget the name of it. Uh, it's got a great flute solo by Ray Reed on it. Um, oh. It's Woman. Woman is the one. Yeah. Okay. Oh, the last man, track. Woman and yeah. Right. And uh, it's and, called Woman. Yeah. Okay. Let me see if I can find it. Kind of a Latin thing, but it's. Mm -hmm. It's. I was listening to it this morning. It's good. What I what I wanted to is I got it right here actually. But yeah. before we before we go into that because you said um, that people ask you about uh, you know like playing with Kenton and that you're famous because of playing with Kenton, uh -huh. but in my opinion as well, you're also famous because you worked with Bob Florence and yeah. you played with Claire Fisher's band as well. And actually, right. when I uh, looked up your discography on discogs.com, you're basically on every Bob Florence record that he basically yeah. made with his with his yeah. big bands. Yeah, except so, for one, and that was done in a decade before that. Yeah. Right, right. And and I mean, you get plenty of, uh, of uh, freedom to to yeah. blow on that on that band and also I'm, I'm not sure if claire fisher's band was like actually like a 
a, a playing band that also was playing around town or was yeah, it more of a recording a, band? A little bit. Well, we played at Dante's, which was an existing then. Right. And uh, some other places, but uh, not too much. But you know, once in a while we would play, you know. It was a hard band to play on because the music was really hard. Oof, yeah. Oh, yeah. On your toes all the time. And oh, he was yeah. playing saxophone, too. Claire was. He was wow. get out front and play soprano saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> and something. He had a curved soprano. So really talented. Cool. <laughs> yeah, that, well, I mean, both Claire and Brent are, you know, like musical centipedes all, almost, you know, like they can yeah. play a bunch of different instruments and all of that. Um, we'll, we'll go into that, into that music as well. But I found Woman, so we can have a listen to uh, Stan mm -hmm. Kenton's Woman also. Okay, from the same. if we're short on time, we can just abbreviate it and play some of it. But uh, Sure. Or, you know, yeah. Whatever you want to do. Yeah, sounds good. Here we go, Woman. Thank you. 
<laughs> really <laughs> cool. Eleven four. Yeah, yeah, right. Great writing. Yeah. I don't think he wrote it in eleven four, but I think it was oh. like three three and five. I think. Uh huh. Yeah. Six. Yeah. Anyway. That's how yeah. I was feeling. It. Five and I, then three. I, right. Yeah, or five. Yeah, sometimes a five came first, and sometimes a six came first. I think yeah. <laughs> that's what I heard. Now, anyway. did D. Barton arrange all this? Yeah. Oh, he, yeah. Wow. He was writing a lot of it on the road. He was writing it wow. in, on tour. Yeah. Yeah. He, he didn't. He had maybe. I think he had half the album done uh, before the road, and then he was always writing. And I was writing on the road too. So, wow. But I was my my and fact that my piece still exists but i don't think they ever played it uh-huh. <laughs> i was writing for the band and uh-huh. and, and uh, showing them my stuff and you know i was trying to get any information i could so yeah he'd look at it but you know i have a lot of two five ones in it so he, <laughs> uh, <laughs> D would anyway, not be happy no. yeah it was a great experience it was a good experience even though you know it wasn't a showcase for me but it was it was fun, but it wasn't the the famous experience that you would think, you know. Right. It didn't, didn't pay worth a darn either. So. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, maybe we should play something that actually features you because uh, mm-hmm. there is this really great record that uh, Claire Fisher actually made with uh, his band, and you were yeah. part of of that band. You recorded like yeah. I believe like maybe one or two records with Claire. Just one, just one. Oh, it's just the. the, the yeah, it was a reissue then after that, so. Yeah. Right, right. And I've seen because I actually just today I saw Brent Fisher and I bought uh-huh. uh, I bought this album Waltz, but Thesaurus uh-huh. uh, Thesaurus is also on uh, on that record. That's right. Um, or the the tracks is on it are on it, and it says that it Warren Marsh was also in the section. That's is right. that true? So yep. it's you, Gary Foster, Warren Marsh, and the rest uh, of the Luciati was it? Uh, forget uh-huh. who the tenor was it? John Lowe. Oh yeah, right, uh-huh. right. Uh, yeah, that's a hell of a section right there. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, it was great. I didn't know what I was in. <laughs> right, and then but, uh, bunker on drums. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Steve Hofstetter was in it as a young Hofstetter. whippersnapper. Yeah, yeah. He was never happy with his solos. He was just uh, really dark about his solo. I thought he played <laughs> great on everything. You know? Oh yeah, and he still sound, it sounds great until oh, yeah. this what day. What a fantastic that's player right. and band leader himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure. you ju- and I think you just recorded uh, his record uh, at Capitol, right? A couple right. months ago. Yeah, we sure did. Same same studio we just heard of. Just now. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So it was yeah. The one tune I did was uh, UMMG. Right. And, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yes. So I'm not. I don't think it's a great solo, but I, I, got <laughs> I think it's great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the second and, time and, this and, record has been played on the our show, actually. Yeah. No. yeah. So that album actually has three titles. Right? Yeah. Right. It was confusing me this morning yeah. when we were emailing. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. it I, was only I, yesterday. I, got, I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. I just got this that? one. That's Waltz. Waltz. And yeah. and um, it has like seven seven other um, seven other tracks on it that aren't feature on the the track or on the record that's called Thesaurus. Uh-huh. Because I know I know UMMG and the Duke from Thesaurus, mm-hmm. and then it's actually also uh, um, published here on on Waltz, which has a slightly different uh, slightly different uh, lineup of, of people. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's not a, identical. No, it's not identical. Um, people who are the same are Lu- uh, Luciati, Bill Perkins, and John Lowe, Conti Condoli, John Odino, and Larry McGuire, Gil Falco, Larry Bunker. And then on your session, Gary Foster, Lead Alto, Warren Marsh and Kim Richmond, Buddy Childers, Steve Hufstetter, Stuart Fisher, Trumpets, Charlie Loper, David Sanchez, and Morris uh, Re- Repass? Or Repass? Uh-huh. Morris Repass. He was my, my bass drum player. And uh, uh, Chuck DeMonico on yeah. bass. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, Good this band. is. Yeah, it's, a, it's an <laughs> yeah. amazing band. Boy. And, and Thesaurus is an amazing record, too. So. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, take a listen to uh, UMMG with uh, an alto solo feature for for Kim. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
great chart, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's so good. Hey, man, but that alto solo of yours, I dig that shit. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't Beautiful. as bad as I thought. Yeah. <laughs> Never is, I actually right? Did, did make some of the changes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I just love that arrangement. I love, it was it the second A that he comes back with the, he does the modulation on the way yeah. out. I right. just, so slick. Interesting place yeah. to do that. And he always found those little nooks and crannies. It seems yeah. To be like well, that. I knew of Claire when I was a kid. Uh, yeah. Not that he was that old, but uh, when he died. But it, it just, uh, I don't know how old he was, but uh, I had heard of him as a piano player, not so much as an arranger, but I mean, his arranging was so unique, you know. And I remember in, 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 listening to albums in my bedroom at, at, in Illinois before I you know, left there and or when, when, maybe it was where it was in college, I don't know. But uh, there was a, a album, I'm not sure it was an LP, it might have been a 10 inch, but anyway, it was Dizzy Gillespie. And it was a band behind Dizzy Gillespie that was kind of odd in makeup, had French horn, I think it had a bassoon, soprano saxophone that didn't double. And uh, it was a weird combination. And I found out much, and it was really great. I said, wow, who wrote that? Nobody was listed. Mm. So Claire wrote it, you know, and no, I found that out much later. And I said, well, no wonder, you know, okay. Mm -hmm. He was very unique. I, I wanted to study orchestration with him. And I went to him and I said, I want to do that. He said, I don't teach orchestration. Oh, <laughs> He was yeah. a grump. He was a grump. You know? yeah. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, that's what I want. He says, I teach piano technique. I'll take you on as a student. I said, well, I'm not a pianist. And he says, well, that's what I teach. I said, <laughs> okay, all right, all right. I was figuring I could probably, you know, turn the corner and get him into into orchestration or something that I yeah. could better use, because I knew I wasn't going to be a great piano player. So, um, uh, so I, I took you know some lessons, and he was giving me all these exercises, and I was, oh man, I couldn't play them, you know, and I'd work on them anyway and practice them, but I never got anywhere. I'm sure I was a terrible student, but at one <laughs> point I remember asking him, I said, Claire, tell me this, at least tell me this, I I I it's trial and error with me you know, when I'm trying to write something. And I said, I, I try it and it's bad. So I write something and I try trial and error. And I said, how do you do that? He says, oh, it's the same with me. It just takes me shorter time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> and and his, I took, yeah, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say on the exercise tip, he's got one of my favorite books for piano called Advanced Harmonic Exercises for Piano. Huh? And I'm still trying to figure out how to play it. It's, it's by some Claire? of the most, by Claire. And oh, they're fascinating. I'll show you a couple. He's got these independent finger exercises. Yeah. You group them in all different groups, and then yeah. he's, he's really kind of. Uh... These arpeggios that are offset by a seventh, and then he goes yeah. through all these different shapes, and he <laughs> gets into great. some really hard stuff. And I'm still yeah. like stumped. He I writes would... it out. It's all written out. But it, I mean, his genius was just so yeah. amazing. Wow. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Something else. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, anyway, uh, sorry for the musical always... interlude, everybody. The piano's right no, here. No, I can't I, resist. I, I <laughs> oh, I wanted to know about that. That's great. I didn't even know about the book. Yeah, yeah. I forget who told me about it. It might have been Cecilia Coleman, my teacher. I think she told me about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, once I brought him, I brought into him a Dave Grusin thing. I had taken off the record. It was an intro or something. Oh. Off of something he did for probably for Quincy. Quincy uh -huh. gets credit for it, <laughs> and uh, it was, but it was, you know, oh yes, that kind of thing. And I said, so is you know, I don't know about my question was Claire. As I said, I'm working on this, and he says, oh, no, well, that's great, but why don't you just voice it another way? You know, take those low notes and put them up here. You know, it's <laughs> real weird. You know, it's it. So he says, and that's the kind of thing that he did. I said. Hmm. Yeah, that's something else. You know. Oh, wow. so I don't know if I get away with that. But I love Grusin. That almost sounded like the opening cue from Three Days of the Condor you just sang. Well, it was. Oh, that's I'm exactly huge. what it was. Oh right? man, I'm a huge Grusin <laughs> fan. Man, I yeah. love his stuff. Mm -hmm. I could totally be seeing that you want to know, like take that yeah. to him. Yeah. What is? Yeah. What's happening? And I didn't copy it exactly. I mean, I was trying to copy it exactly then as a takedown. Uh -huh, right. But I, I used it in one of my pieces. Uh, what wow. I did come up with. It's not exactly. The same thing, and it's probably not as good, but <laughs> but uh, but it, uh, it 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 was a great idea that Dave Grusin had for that. Oh, you know, I love and, that. And cool. I used I used that for one of my pieces. Oh, cool! Great. Oh, I want to hear that. <laughs> yeah, 
So good. Wait, Kevin, what what's, you, what's next? Where do you want to go from here? <laughs> Um, well, I actually, um, maybe it's a cool thing to actually go to the Bob Florence thing that you, uh, uh, okay. that you uh, sent over. Cause okay. so you've been, you've been part of, of Stan Kenton's band, of Claire Fisher's bands, of Bob Florence band. And the thing that's unique about those bands is their instrumentation because Stan Kenton has two bass bones and five trumpets and had the, the mellophones at some point, two bar yeah. baritones, yeah. yes. Yeah. Bob Florence also had the same thing, two baritones. Mm -hmm. Then Claire also has like all of these different, uh, he has like an extra sax player for bass sax and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, you basically, with your uh, concert jazz orchestra, because you have your own concert jazz orchestra, mm -hmm. um, basically I noticed that uh, there's like a similar thing happening that you have like, uh, a lot of doubles for your for your sax section. Right. Your lead alto double player, reads. yeah, the double reads, and your lead alto player plays oboe as well. Then you have two French horns added, and you have also a percussion section added to that. And my question for you basically was like, uh, I'm sure that these experiences with Claire and with Kenton and with uh, Bob Florence have sort of like inspired you to go down a similar path and try to discover like different type. Of colors that you can find in yeah. your own in your own pieces as well. Right. So I was wondering if you can um, maybe shed some some light about that. Like how how did you yeah. what what was what was for example your decision to go for like uh, a double reed woodwind yeah. section with two horns and an extra percussion section? Yeah, well I'm I'm trying to emulate a classical uh, approach to right. things uh, with uh, what they call legit music. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. Uh, those those experiences and those uh, 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 instrumentations did influence me a lot about that. And uh, not only the, uh, you know, I mean, it's easy to just go with what everybody else has done, like two flutes, two clarinets, and bass clarinet. And, you know, that's that's the woodwind section as far as doubles concerned. But I wanted to have the double reeds in there, so. Uh, the, what I have in my group, as you know, is uh, the first alto plays alto soprano, uh, flute, piccolo. The second alto plays um, the, um, well, everybody plays flutes, uh, plays alto and uh, oboe. The first tenor plays um, tenor and clarinet mainly, mm -hmm. uh, also flute and so on. And then the uh, fourth, the uh, fourth voice is uh, English horn and with, with the tenor saxophone and then the bottom of it is uh, not only bass clarinet but also bassoon mm. so that's that was you know i can't you know, spread it out all over the place <laughs> so yeah that's what i wanted to do and um i have my one of my reasons for the, doing this if i can express myself clearly here is that when i listen to, to a lot of classical music especially uh 20th century uh, or early 20th century music tonal music there's a lot of emotion in it you know i get a, a big feeling of emotion i don't get that same kind of emotion from a lot of jazz mm. um mainly it's all on one level uh i mean nothing swings like 4-4 I mean, <laughs> that, that thing it, it swings whereas classical music isn't trying to swing and, and i love the swing but um i'm trying to get that emotion out of out of a lot of these things i uh i spent some time with uh, lalo schiffer as mm. kind of an assistant to him and Wow. And, uh, I wanted to take lessons, but he didn't want to teach. And so I said, well, can I hang with you? So I hung with him for about two or three years. Wow. I was over there a lot and so forth. And I took some arranging lessons uh, anyway. And, uh, and, and I think he, he finally, he said, well, he says, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach anymore. He said, I think you should take some acting lessons. I said, acting lessons? <laughs> Why? <laughs> you know. Interesting. He, he says, you need to have more emotion in your music. Oh, said, mm. well, okay. So that's, that's, he guided me onto that path. And I said, I'm going to go and listen to stuff, stuff that is really, you know, really is emotion in it. Jazz wasn't doing that for me, most of it. Mm -hmm. um, so the classical music was, uh, you know, uh, everybody from uh, Beethoven up, but, you know, uh, Rachmaninoff and all that stuff. And Shostakovich was one of my favorites and, and uh, Sibelius. Oh, mine too, Shostakovich. Yeah. A lot of those people, and I, I just feel so, so much, you know, uh, contrast and emotion in those things, 
and and uh, it's a bigger range. So that's what I wanted to produce in jazz. So that's the reason that I kind of chose that. But you were right, those those groups. And as a matter of fact, before we play this one with Bob Florence, if you'll allow me, I'd like to uh, play something that did influence me as far as instrumentation. Yeah, uh, it, it goes way overboard. But this is the Sauter Finnegan Orchestra. Right. And uh, they they were a group. I don't know how long they lasted. I don't. I didn't follow them at the time, but I heard several things and got several records. And this was uh, 50s. And um, I only have vinyl, but I did transfer some of them to digital. And a lot of it was uh, like gimmicky and just tricky stuff, and you know, uh, like five, five, five five players and stuff like that, you know. But it was using all kinds of different sounds. Mm. So I picked one out that was. Uh, uh, that kind of shows that it happens to be a ballad, and it's uh, uh, "Have You Met Miss Jones." Yeah. So if if you, I don't know if I have it queued up. So let me find it first. And, uh, yeah, and, and also talk make sure that yourselves. you're sharing. Uh, <laughs> and also make sure that you're sharing your sounds with uh, with us. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Uh, let's see. If I've got something else up here. Let's see. curious about this because I've never heard about this. Yeah, I'm very curious. This is cool. Thanks for sharing it with us, Kim. Sure. Yeah, I have it here. I'm just looking for that piece. Doodle Town Races, one of them. <laughs> <laughs> They're all funny things. Here's Happy Minutes. Okay, so I have it up. Um, so I'll share a sound and uh, where are we? Oh, yeah, um, okay, here we go. This is uh, Happy Met Miss Jones, and maybe I won't play all of it. Or I don't know how, what our time is like, but uh, are we crunched in time, or are we just keep going until we run out of things to say to each other? I, I, I guess the latter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Share computer sound. Why? Oh, why isn't that? Why isn't one of the choices what I had here? <laughs> oh, advanced. Remember going? Oh, that's advanced. right. Yeah. Then, that, then it's the middle one. Yeah. I see that, but I mean, I don't have any other screens except three. Just uh, oh, well, maybe it'll work. Maybe it's already sharing. Oh no, we don't have the, no, the notice. There's not the notification. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe I can go to do share. Are we sharing now? Yeah. There you but go. Sharing screen too, right? See yeah. if it'll play it, now. See if we I hear hit, it. Okay. Okay. I heard I had advanced, but it didn't do anything. So, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> maybe this okay. will work. I'm not hearing it yet either, so. Oh, I think okay. it's not playing just yet. Just one second. Yes. There it is. It works. Notice how the texture changes.
Yeah, wow. that was Eddie Sauter's, Eddie Sauter's uh, oh. writing. Isn't that nice? Oh uh, my God, what a beautiful yeah. writer! His, his, but you know, it. Wow. I mean, you got one part. The melody's all over the place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if I had, had a student that wrote that, I'd say, yeah, you, know, you got to do more of the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My good because friend, it was hard to follow, uh, but it was so clever. You know? Oh yeah. my goodness, my good friend yeah. Carla Perez is here, and she's commenting. She's loving this, by the way. She's a wonderful vocalist, and she said huh? I, a tinge of Vaughn Williams in there. Yes, and oh, I yeah. can totally agree with that, Carla. I yeah. think, yeah. and a lot of other influences, a little Gil Evans. I mean, a little Russ Garcia. Mm -hmm. other, I heard a lot of different things going. On. I'm sure Gil Evans heard a lot of that too. Yeah, what great writing! Uh, wow, right. thanks for sharing. Right. That. Well, let's talk about Bob Florence for a minute because yeah. Bob was a friend of mine, and we did a lot of. Um, of hanging out together and talking and stuff on the phone and all this stuff, and uh, he. Uh, I started in his band in the late seventies. He started the, the band he called the, the, the Limited Edition. Limited, limited edition. edition, yeah, yeah. And uh, it was like you said, six saxophones, to bar one baritone on each end of the saxophone section. Otherwise, it was the same uh, uh, saxophone configuration. Uh, five trombones, uh, I believe it was. Uh, five trumpets. Um, didn't add guitar until later, but he had guitar uh, Larry Coons later on, and uh, it was uh, himself on piano and then bass and drums. And uh, so Nick Ciroli, yeah, Nick Ciroli was the original drummer yeah. that I when I was with the band. So yeah. I started on baritone on that band, one of the baritones. Lee Callett and I were the baritone players. Oh, and Lee. Then, yeah, and then uh, I changed to I think I played tenor at one point but then finally got to the alto chair that i really wanted to play and uh it was um uh see, i'm trying to think who played who was playing lead alto i think i think perk at one point but uh i eventually did play lead alto and then when lanny morgan decided to come back on the band and right uh, second so uh that was it was always fun to do it the thing about bob's music is it was so well written craft wise all the voice leading was so right and so pro you know just lent to everybody was playing a melody and so forth it was a little bit dangerous because everybody would be so relaxed and not paying attention when something would come along that was hard to play you know was technically and all of a sudden we said oh my god i guess i gotta really you know, knuckle <laughs> down and play this stuff and we so the sight reading was funny because it'd be something in each chart that would be a little hard you know and uh but it, Otherwise, it really flowed. And, this, and I asked him one time, I said, uh, uh, do you write, you know, a lot of people write vertically, and he writes horizontally all the time, each voice, like first trumpet and then the second trumpet and so forth. I said, do you, do you always write that way? He says, oh, doesn't everybody? <laughs> I said, no, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, this was one of my favorite arrangements uh, that he did. I'm all smiles. And, they, right. and uh, I was lucky to to get to be featured on that, so it'd be good to play it. Yeah, let me uh, s screen share. I'm going to share the sounds, and we'll listen to I'm All Smiles from the Bob Florence Limited Edition featuring Kim. Just a second. Yep, yeah, here we go. I'm not hearing it, Kevin. Um, uh, my media player needs a little bit of time. Oh, Here we okay. go. Okay. Okay. Yeah.
Great solo. Yeah. What a great chart, huh? yeah. Oh, yeah. it's such a great I, chart. I'd grown a little bit since the Claire Fisher recording, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who was, who was the drummer on that? I don't remember. Oh, that's Erskine. Erskine. Oh, mm -hmm. Without I a didn't doubt. realize that. Okay. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> he didn't really, he didn't usually play with the band. I mean, mm -hmm. the record, I guess. Yeah. 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 That was a late one. That's great. That piano break reminded me of the one time I played with Phil Norman's Tentet. Uh -huh. I think you were on it, and uh -huh. uh, up at Mammoth Flakes, and Bob had just passed, oh. and everyone was, of course, sad about that, and I was nervous as all <laughs> hell right. to yeah. play the, the chair, and there was a moment in the book where everyone dropped out, and it was just piano, yeah. and I, yeah. I, totally, <laughs> I totally ate it right there, <laughs> and I, was, I must have turned bright red, and uh, I went home, and I remember, like, Finding the record and learning it. I'm going, I'm gonna, next time they call me, I'm yeah. going to get this. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, you reminded me of that with his writing yeah. style and how he'd put pitfalls in his charts like that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, he used to, this is a strange thing now. I don't know what to make of this. He, uh, through our relationship of talking and hanging and so forth and, and uh, uh, sharing ideas, he would lead me to a lot of really great things to listen to, mm. you know, and I'm, I guess mm. he was listening to them also. But he never changed with that. And that was always strange. Uh, hmm. Because every time I listen to something and really absorb it, I try to change and just try to bring it into my own, you know. Yeah. And, and it takes a while to do that. You first, first you copy, you know, and re use it in different ways and think of it in different ways. And sometimes you don't use it. But um, I, I'm always trying to expand my, my stuff. And he didn't seem to want to do that. Hmm. You know? uh, I, I know he was really enthusiastic about it couple people a German guy that was writing and so forth and I was expecting to hear some of that you know one of these mm. days or a hint of it or you know I never did he never mm. did want to want to go beyond what he was doing already oh. I don't know okay. why that was but he, he, what he was doing was great you know yeah exactly yeah. I can attest to that like how you're trying to uh, evolve and you know like putting new things in your pieces because the last rehearsal that we did at the at the at the union before uh COVID and all of that stuff right. we did this thing and you said like yeah i want to have like this this groove that is affiliated with like snarky puppy because you heard about <laughs> snarky puppy right right and there was like this 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 tom thing and i was like oh yeah i know what you mean and you just, then you know like we did this thing and you and i i heard it you know like that you listen actually to the band and put some really cool things in there mm -hmm. you know like a complete vibe change but you yeah. know like that's, it's a it's a super simple uh, example, but you know, like I could totally right. attest to that fact that you're still trying to put you know like new things yeah. together. Yeah, and and I I want to be influenced. I want to be uh, you know I want to change up and and you know take stuff in. I don't uh, somebody. I remember one time I was doing a clinic uh, in New Jersey. It was with uh, the Canton Alumni Band, hmm. Mike Vax's band, yeah. and uh, we were doing the sax section and. A student sax section uh, with all our saxes, and I said, you know, listen to records and copy stuff. And I said, when I, said hey, Olima, I got a question. Isn't that plagiarism? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, yeah, I guess so. I said, when you learn to talk, it was plagiarism too. Oh, yeah, 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 right. Yeah. Good point. Because you imitated everything you could hear, and, and finally, it started to make sense. You know, yeah. so uh, that's that's my answer to that. Yeah, we're all plagiarists, and, and of course, the old thing is if you steal from one guy that's stealing but if you steal from everybody that's research you know? yeah exactly <laughs> yeah so that's the old adage you know? yeah well uh this uh i i would suggest we play um, street of dreams if you don't mind yeah of course and, is that okay and uh that's a chart of mine that i did uh many years ago actually before digital notation and i had it copied finally but um, that's where I tried to emulate a whole bunch of stuff. And yeah. It's, it's, uh, I, I don't know if it comes out as me, I don't care, but <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I had everything. I had a march in there. I had uh, <laughs> a r real uh, slow groove. I had all, all kinds of, you know, Maynard stuff. And, and, uh, but I was, it was a commission that uh, Herb Patno asked me to do. He was at, up at Fresno uh, or Danza college, I think it was. And so uh, I in contact with him and he said I want you to do commission for my band I said what do you want me to do he says anything you want 
Mm. Do it, uh, no holds barred, you know. I said, really? You know, how about doubles? Anything? You know? <laughs> said, I don't have any double reads, but any, you know. And and uh, I said, how about style? Like, anything? You know, I mean, he was just on that, you know. So I said, well, okay, <laughs> you know. And uh, I put the intro on here later, which was ends up to be a free thing. And uh, 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 I don't know the names again. Um, saxophone player. Uh, Played with Shelley for a while. That guy. Richie? Huh? Rich, yeah, Richie Kamuka? No, no, uh, later. Oh, la oh, later. Much later. Um, he was an you know, out player. And he, he and uh, I forget who the trumpet player was at that time, but uh, I'll think of it. Yeah. Anyway, he has a free solo in here, which is very intriguing. Ah. He played in a band uh, for a while while he was still in town. He's in Oregon now. but And, and I remember one time he was, it was a cadenza thing. He was, and and he said there's a rehearsal and he was uh, it was okay it was his time to play he didn't make a sound yeah. you know, i said it's your solo he says i'm playing it <laughs> <laughs> you know, space yeah space. right yeah uh oh gosh names I'll think of it in a second. Yeah, anyway, yeah. <laughs> so I I start off playing the tune as the tune, and then it kind of goes off left, left uh, from there yeah. into the free thing. And, uh, yeah. Um, and then it, when it, the the part that I wrote for the school band starts when a march plays, you have a march that comes in here plays. Right. So, so uh, this is Street of Dreams, and uh, and I get a, a little solo at the beginning and a little solo at the end. So. Oh. A, lot of, a lot of players. All the yeah. saxophone, all the saxophone soloists get to play on this. Here we go. Street of Dreams by the Kim Richmond Concert Jazz Orchestra.
little bit of everybody in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ray Stravinsky yeah. near the end. Uh, yeah. Uh, Bill, Bill Russo, a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, so I copied everybody I could. <laughs> <laughs> and it's still you. It's still you yeah. the whole time. That's well, that's, that's the point. It. You yeah. mix all these things together and it's me. You know, so. Right, right. But, right but one too. of my, my feelings of accomplishment about it is I think that I uh, – uh, did what Lalo Schifrin said, and I, I was after the emotion, and I think I'm, I'm starting to get it a little bit. Now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would say so. I love, yeah, I yeah. love it. I, lo I love it. You know, the all the different influences, and it basically is it. You turn the whole song in in a in a story with like maybe three or four certain parts or different atmospheres right. and and like very tiny aspect of it's like i'm always a fan of a uh, big band that involves a tuba and the way how you incorporate the sound of the tuba in yeah. the in those voicings mm. I, I love it how you use yeah. that instrument in yeah. your, in your yeah, arrangements. Me too. yeah i love yeah. the conical instruments the french yeah. horns and the tuba especially yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to live without those guys <laughs> <laughs> i heard a little uh, almost charles ives central park in the dark or something yeah. in there yeah, I, something in and that one where you have the melody in the background with the mm -hmm. brass real spooky, right like that was so eerie yeah john eerie? gross was the, uh, the tenor saxophone player oh that's john gross. yes yeah john gross. We know him, right? beautiful sound that he has oh yeah he's a good player. yeah yeah, working now, but he was, he was out. He was in my first small group too. And, mm. uh, oh. He and Mike Fawn. Uh, oh, Mike Fawn, yeah. Al Tremont player. So they're on my first album. But, uh, it's uh, so I miss those guys, but uh, you know we move on, and that's what we have to do. Yeah. yeah. Fortunately, yeah. for where we live, there's a lot of great, and I mean great musicians, and uh, young yes. and old. But uh, it's a, a new wave is coming in, and that's great. It's influencing yeah. the old guys like myself so it's you know, it's a lot of fun it's a lot yeah. of fun. It's a new new adventures really mm -hmm. yeah and you two are part of that you know both of you guys <laughs> so Honored and i proud certainly to be. appreciate yeah. your playing it as well thank you ken thank yeah. you yeah so i think that kind of winds things up for yeah. me yeah how do you follow yeah. that <laughs> yeah right that's great <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean the, the the all of the the all of the influences all of the earlier bands that you were in and that you can show that you know like in one track and how right. that has influenced you is 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 a, a beautiful way of wrapping things up so uh on that note uh i w would sincerely like to thank you for you know like for taking the time to speak with us and showing all of these uh, great, uh, great musical uh, uh, examples as well, because uh, lots of people uh, here on Facebook also don't know about these records and myself also included. I wasn't familiar with the Dee Barton uh, recording, yeah. for example, of Stan Kenton. So that's mm -hmm. always great to, uh, to, uh, you know, like enrich uh, the, you know, like the mm -hmm. musical whereabouts and all of that. So that's really, really, really great. And thank you great. so much. And, Thanks for uh, for all of your uh, for musical inspiration that you've been that you gave me and you know like with sure. playing with you and I, that goes for Josh as well. Likewise. So yeah, great. Yeah. Well, I I enjoy playing with you guys all the time. So, uh, and uh, Ke I'm part of Kevin's band. I just love to do that. Yeah, so it's great. Yeah. Well, I I hope I hope for sure once all of this you know the, mm -hmm. it's my priority to uh, bring the band together as soon as possible after COVID is all done and dealt with you know it's on my priority list. Yeah, that's good. That's I'm looking forward to that. And you know, there's always a way to do the overdub stuff you know, and play that's together right. that way. But yeah, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, Clay, uh, my friend Clay Jenkins came out with a album uh, and he put it on YouTube. I don't know whether he did yeah. it remotely, but. It's with uh, trumpet. He plays trumpet, and then uh, two guitars. Oh yeah, and and two and, and uh, two, drummers. two drummers. Yeah, two drums. And, and Hammer. Yeah, and Hammer. Right. Yeah. Oh and then, wow. And, and, I have to hear John that. Clayton on some of the things. Oh so. my goodness. It can. I think that was done remotely. Oh sure. wow. I think it no? was maybe like made just before COVID oh. because it's at Tally's. I recognize I Tally's that. studio. Yeah, oh. I did too. I did too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think he maybe recorded it like right before that. So, yeah. but uh, that definitely uh, uh, that definitely reminds me that uh, for all of the people who are listening and watching, like go to Kim's website and if you want to uh, buy a record, uh, it's all on in Kim's website. All of his small group and his big band stuff is available over there. Yeah. So definitely check that that stuff out. 
Good, and uh, for uh, for next week, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special guest, um, uh, one of the most legendary trombone players actually in the world of jazz. Mr. Dick Nash is going to talk with us. So. <laughs> okay, that's, that's, that's be, great. That's going to be I'll very be tuned exciting. In. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, Kim, you're one of the cats, man. So we couldn't yes. leave you out for sure. No, that's for sure. Well, you know uh, that phrase that you just said, one of the cats. Uh, was a, a very important to me because Johnny Mandel said that to me one day. Oh. After, you, after you heard my Refractions album, he says, I got to tell you, you're one of us. So, oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, and, more can I ask than that? I don't think I'm worthy, but still, you know, <laughs> it's great. Well, in my opinion, you are. You are Definitely. very worthy. Yes. Like, for sure. Well, we're all on a learning yeah. curve, so that's, that's great. Right. Yeah. Hey, thanks a lot to you guys for having me. I oh, really appreciate thank you, it. Kim. A lot yeah. of fun. And uh, yeah. you, you stay, guy. You guys stay healthy, and I will too. So, yes. and I'll We're be back in LA best. when when it's going to happen. So I'm I'm in Wisconsin Northwoods right now, but uh, I'll be uh, I'll be back there. Can't wait! Can't Looking wait to, to see hang you again. again. Okay, yeah. great. All right. Thanks, Ken. Take care of yourself. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. And also for everybody on Facebook, we say goodbye. See you guys next week. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I will stop the recording.